So let's start then. Um, yeah, doors closed. Good. So we are going to talk today about recurrent neural networks with TensorFlow 2.0. That's the session for today. And actually, uh, first of all, I would like to obviously thank all the organization behind this. It was fantastic. I think it was a fantastic day, right? Uh, and obviously, our company, uh, really proud of all of you guys. But with the help of Microsoft, with the help of uh, our Universidad San Pablo, uh, I think it has been a, a, a wonderful day. It has been, this is the last session, so you are a very brave bunch. So thanks for coming to this session with this title, knowing what you are coming to uh, as the last session of the day. I think that deserves a round of applause, right? Just yeah. to start with you, so <laughs> please round of yourselves. Good. Okay, so um, let's move on. We'll just start with uh, something that you all have seen in your, in your houses. Uh, probably all of you have already uh, interacted with uh, personal assistants like Google Home and Siri and, and Analytics Psycho. We all have this at home. And normally we think, well, this is great. We are living in such an advanced area where I can talk to a device and this device understands what I'm saying and this is fantastic. It's the first time this is happening. And actually it's not because I'm quite old now and I was playing into these kind of games in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and for me, in my head, it was exactly the same thing. It was a conversational story, conversational story. So I will say some orders, write some orders, and I will get back some results. So for me, it, it will do the trick. And actually, well, this is games, you can say, but we are doing much more advanced stuff right now. We are uh, using um, conversational interfaces in healthcare, for example, and there's wonderful scenarios for that. There's some of them I really love. Uh, we all know that in this day, even though that seems incredible in the age of connected, everyone is connected, but there's a lot of loneliness in the world. There's a lot of people that's really lonely. And there's some services, and this one I'm going to present is fantastic. It's the Wobot, uh, published in 2017. Uh, the Wobot is a conversational interface where well, basically their mission is to cheer you up, to enhance your mood. Uh, and it's fantastic in the sense that it even can initiate the contact. If it sees that you have not engaged in a conversation with the, with the bot in, in quite a long time, or it checks your agenda and you should be having some time or changes in the patterns, it can engage in the contact. That's fantastic. But even this stuff, we've already seen it. Obviously not so advanced, but uh, for the mental welfare, for example, uh, back in the 60s, we had ELISA which was a very, very crude, very, very basic uh, interface, conversational interface, but it was uh, basically oriented for simulating a psychiatric uh, advisor. Okay, so it was, well, basically the same thing. But why, why I'm going through the history to show this kind of stuff? Because in all these decades, in the 60s, in the 80s, in the 90s, right now, we live thinking that the conversational AI is almost there. We always have the same perception that we are almost just about to solve, to solve the problem. And yes, it seems that we at last are almost there, but I don't know what's going to happen in the next 15 years, and that's a conversation <laughs> we had, uh, Edu and myself. So uh, that's what we are going to be talking about today. So today I have with, my, uh, with me uh, Edu, Edu Matayanas is our AI lead, uh, Edu Aka Ignatius Farray. <laughs> 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 and myself, Paolo Doval, I am the, the data architect, main data architect in the, in the, UK, um, in the UK team of Plain Concepts. And we are going to talk about language uh, processing, NLP mostly. Uh, so, what we are going to be dealing with mostly is uh, bringing sequences into neural networks today. And for that, uh, we will see that there's quite a few uh, scenarios, so we can use them for anomaly detection, for forecasting, time series, any kind of signal analysis. But we are going to be focusing on NLP today. And um, we are going to see one of the main implementation techniques uh, based on recurrent neural networks and what recurrent neural networks are. And to do so, Edu is going to show you some code and the code is going to be built on TensorFlow 2.0. Uh, that's the new and upcoming version of TensorFlow. A uh, large number of changes. So it's going to serve as an excuse to see uh, how TensorFlow 2.0 looks like. Uh, and finally, attention. Uh, this is not moving forwards. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I need someone to press a key. 
you know the technology. <laughs> These days. <laughs> China? Yeah. Uh, so you're going to sit there, click on next, next. Yep. Good. <laughs> so we are going to make some slight changes to the agenda as well. So some surprises coming, so attention to that. Uh, what we will not learn today, so this is the disappointment phase of the doggy. Uh, we are not going to talk about neural networks. I presume you already knew, know what a neural network is. I'm not going to talk about what an autoencoder is because I presume you already know all the pieces that uh, form a neural network arch architecture. Uh, that doesn't mean that if you don't know anything of this, you are not going to get any benefit from this session. Uh, I hope that's not the case. But again, this is not for, for novices. So we are not going to get into mathematics. We are not going to get into mm, crazy demonstrations. Not today, but what we are going to be doing is focus on, uh, well, the new models, the new uh, opportunities we have ahead. So we are not going to talk about TensorFlow. We are not going to talk about Python, so no code at all. We are the code that uh, Edu is going to show is just going to be focused on the build of the models. And last but not least, we are not going to talk, this is probably most important, about the Star Trek lore, because I presume that all of you obviously are Trekkies. I hope so. If you are not, then we might have some issues. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> let's try to move on. Again, Edu, I think we are going to <laughs> <laughs> go manual. <laughs> yep. Oh, yep. sorry. The that's so to you. OK, that's yeah. to you. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, as we were thin talking this afternoon, follow me. Technology is here, and it's going to be with us a lot of time. Uh, it's going to come in with us. But it's not about only technology. It's more about how can we interact with technology, right? Mm, we are also very frustrated in the past. Uh, Paolo said that machines can deceive us in the past only just giving us some kind of uh, mm, languages that was trying to follow uh, their lead. But uh, right now, what we are thinking is more how can we uh, make this interaction with our artificial intelligence, right? In this film, I don't know if any of you have seen this one. Uh, it's called Hair. Uh, I don't want to make any spoilers because this is a free spoiler presentation. But uh, we can see clearly the mm, relationships between uh, personal assistants and uh, human. So in here, we can see that this personal assistant can be with the human outside an environment, uh, having fun, uh, it's communicating through the camera uh, in the pocket, and also it can talk with him through the airbat and uh, because it has a micro microphone, and he is going to talk with her as uh, you know, uh, is like his colleague. So after that, um, I wanted to introduce this linguistic that is. Uh, very uh, special to me, not only because of his linguistics, also it's a very political uh, image uh, of the 90s and the 80s. But we are focusing on what is he he's saying there, that um, language is a process that is free and is based on our um, freely willed. So mm, it's very rare to how can we put this inside a machine, right? Because Sometimes it can be like it never gets to the point that we wanted to just interact with it, or maybe it's just only extracting information, common information from the data that we have. So as Chomsky said there, uh, we need uh, to take that freely will inside our models. How to do that is an upcoming uh, task that I hope some of you can see in this talk today. But so basically, all that Chomsky said in that part of talk was that this is hard, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You just wanted to <laughs> <laughs> clarify. Yeah, you know, it's like I read a lot of him, and <laughs> sometimes my mind is not that good. But here you got another important person in our lives is Doc Emmett Brown, and he said in Back into the Future that we are not ready for the fourth dimension, dimension right? <laughs> And what is that four dimension that he's mentioned? Time, right? Time is a sequence. Uh, near when we are talking, it's kind of a sequence that words, and we contextualize it about uh, when we are talking with the other person. We know some context, right? 
So how can we take that variable inside our models? Well, one answer was John Hopfield, 1982. He made these dynamic neural networks. It was like an amazing step in the run of these models. Artificial intelligence became again uh, in, the, in the rocks uh, in, that, in, in that decade. And he made a uh, dynamics structure by taking the information from the outside to put in, in again in the, uh, in the inside through a uh, vector that is kind of a memory, right? Those feedback loops are representing that dynamics inside. So what is a recurrent neural network and is what this talk is about? You have in there that that feedback loop, okay, is going to take that information and represent kind of a state inside the network, right? So how is that this done? Uh, with uh, something that many of you maybe hate, that's mathematics. Uh, you have a lot of differential equations in there. It's kind of very complex, and maybe none, none of you knows about it, but if you wanted to represent a model with differential equations, you can do it. It's like, but we don't recommend it, right? Maybe we can just go for another simple approach, but these networks were conceived for tasks like signal processing or maybe forecasting, but we wanted to apply them for natural language processing. And how can we process sequence of words, uh, of text inside that? So you remember that we were talking about memory, internal state, and whatever, right? Uh, those uh, feedback loops can represent a short memory, and you know the best Mm, character of the films, right? This story is like the one that is representing this storm, short memory that it has only for two seconds and then forget everything, right? So imagine that we have these neural networks that we wanted to feed with sequence. It's very difficult to see uh, this representation as abstract representation with that feedback loop. So we wanted to unroll them and see how can we put uh, text inside it, right? So imagine that we have uh, those uh, units there that are putting text inside, and we are processing it through the entire sequence, right? We are extracting information inside and get it through a thought vector and extracting all that context and generate there a simple output that we wanted. We are translating text with the machine. So the idea in here is that um, recurrent neural networks are going to process that sequence of words and are going to struggle the information and get what we need from them. Yeah. Right, Pablo? Yeah, but then we will have a problem, which I think probably most of you will see. What will happen if our change of words or characters is too large? So one of the problems that mm -hmm. we will have in, this in that case is that the internal state that's passed from one to the other uh, neuron, uh, that's going to degrade somehow. It's going to lose the, the ability to understand what's important and what's not, what's the, the, the context of the beginning, mostly of the beginning of the section, uh, because it's going to be degrading, right? That's the problem we have. Yeah, I saw what you're saying in there, but don't worry about it. I've <laughs> got this cover with LSTMs. Here is the, those are the acronyms from long short-term memory, right? So what is special about this recurrent neural network? It's about that we have an operation that it takes into account not only short memory, but also that uh, information from a long string in which we have all those uh, correlation with the previous uh, steps of the execution. So we have like a three functions in one. We have a forget gate to just take out the information or grade the information that we want from the past. Another update one that is only taking the last part, that is that short term. And finally, an output that is going to fire this LSTM cell, right? So those are the ones that are going to take into account that uh, relationship from long uh, strings of text. So, but how can we just take this inside of recurrent neural networks, because right now what we are seeing is, okay, we are putting inside a model, a recurrent neural network, but how can we put that, Pablo? I don't, I don't really know what to do with that. <laughs> this is the first time we're talking about this, as you can see. <laughs> um, so 
Actually, the LSTM part is way harder than this. I have a very simple solution for this. For this, we are going to be using embeddings. This is not anything new, but it's important that we all know what we are talking about here. So obviously, I cannot pass a text to a function if I want to pass as a parameter to minimize that function. I cannot pass text. So I need to find a numerical representation of each of the words in my corpus. So what I'm going to do is create a very large dimensional space, actually as large as number of words I have in my whole corpus. So for example, if I'm reading all the different words in all the articles from Wikipedia in English, we are talking about some 50K uh, words, so, so 50,000 uh, dimensions. So what I'm going to be creating then is a 50,000 dimension space, uh, and each word is going to be a number, actually a vector of 50,000 values. One of the values is itself, it's one, it's the number. It's so as close as possible as itself because it's the same uh, word. But the rest of the 49999 uh, different components, dimensions in the vector, is going to be the rest of the words in my corpus and the semantic distance, how likely they are close together in my whole set of documents. So basically what I'm building is a numerical representation of all my words and also some semantics of the words, which words come together, which words are related, which is quite amazing, quite pow powerful. And then I have a vector I can pass to my models. So that's pretty easy to, to use then. So you have your, your vector. Whoa, then. so um, as we see before, we needed a model to pass text so we can just extract some kind of tax from that. We have a classify, uh, classification problem in there. Uh, we need to extract that information from a text, and we see word embeddings to pass from um, text to a higher dimensionality that our networks can understand, right? So um, we have our little Frankenstein there. We have that model in there that we can just create those relationships from uh, words, like you said there, and extract all the embeddings and all the vectors that we wanted, after that, what we are going to do is extract the information through the LSTMs, extract all those characteristics uh, with the internal state of the network, and finally obtain what it is the um, classification of our problems. In this, in this uh, problem that we have is like to take locations and, and other important things inside that sequence of, of text, right? But I don't know how to implement it, Pablo. I normally use my own neural networks. Back in 2010, I made my own, uh, you know, uh, this um, software that I, that I did for networks, but... You built it in Assembler, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I wrote it in C++. So wow. what can we do right now? Well, obviously, we only have one good answer for that, which is TensorFlow. So one question for you. Who here in the audience like PyTorch? I scare you. Good. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to talk about TensorFlow, but let's talk about uh, TensorFlow V2. So how many of you, and actually this is a no, no th there will be no punishment uh, for this, but uh, who has worked with a different framework, deep learning framework other than TensorFlow? Please raise your hands. Well, my team, yeah, good. <laughs> You're all fired. Um, <laughs> good. Uh, so. Any of you has worked with TensorFlow 1.0 or 1. Point something? Okay. okay, so this is going to be uh, interesting. So in TensorFlow 1.x, uh, we have a scenario to build our model, something like this. We are going to build something very, very simple. We are going to build a linear function, and we are going to apply a rectify linear unit uh, function on top of that. Uh, so to build this, I need, first of all, to create a graph, a computational graph. And the graph is going to be something like that. I will have my matrix multiplication, so I will multiply uh, my weights and the inputs, and I will then add the bias, so that's the linear function, and then I will um, multiply, I will apply the rectified linear unit. Uh, I need to create this as a graph because I need to make sure that the computation can be distributed as different pieces that then they are joined together, the different result sets, so I can distribute them on CPUs, GPUs, TPUs, whatever. So to create this, I need to well, consider some 
pieces of language in the in, in TensorFlow. One of them is the variables, which we have there uh, V and X, and the inputs, which are the placeholders, uh, sorry, V and W, and the input is the X. We have for the operators, but then we have something which is really important, uh, which is not seen on the graph, but it's what allows us to execute the graph, which is the session. I cannot execute the graph uh, immediately without tying it to a session. In TensorFlow 1, I'm talking about that. So you will see that to create this graph, it's not really difficult. I will just create, uh, initialize the variables, initialize the placeholder, and then create, you will see, uh, hopefully, the ReLU function, the, mat uh, the matrix multiplication, the different parameters, and the addition. And then I need to create a session, and I need to pass that graph to that session. So I cre can create a lot of very crazy things. I can create sessions, multiple sessions com with multiple graphs distributed differently in different hardware, but that's something we normally don't do. 99% of the time, we don't really need this infrastructure. So this is really convoluted. This is cumbersome. So TensorFlow 2 simplifies this a lot. It's taking an eager approach by default, so you don't really need to create the session. You have the session alre uh, already there. This is much more convenient, much more practical. And this is not the only change. This is probably one of the biggest changes, but we have a lot of changes as well. So we have, well, first of all, a huge increase in performance. Then they've done a lot of cleaning in terms of libraries, country packages, etc. So now it's all much clean and tidy. Uh, it's more Pythonic. It's uh, actually it's so Pythonic that uh, no app is still alive, so everything is going to break. So if you want to migrate from TensorFlow 1. Point whatever to 2, um, well, be aware that they are very, very, very different. So things will need to be migrated. So we have toolings for migrating that. Uh, I normally don't recommend using them. I uh, recommend creating the models from scratch, but that's just, you know. That's me. Uh, so that's TensorFlow 2.0. Now, we are going to uh, show the actual implementation of a recurrent neural network, but I'm going to trust you with a little bit of a secret from me. So I'm already an old guy. There's only two products I handle well. One of them is PowerPoint, and the other one is the product I use for my hair for the course. So <laughs> I'm going to give this to Edu. Edu, this is yours. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, I will try to just quit this. Yep. And then. Uh, anyway, just in case someone wonders, that's a lie. My horse are, my cards are natural. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think. Okay, so what we use normally to make our models and the part that Pablo said to me, show me the code as you know Jerry Maguire, the previous one. Um, okay, what we're doing to today is uh, to build a neural machine uh, translation. We see that approach, uh, right? Until the pier goes dry, right? So we are trying to do that, okay? With some kind of magic inside this, um, this notebook that I have in here. We normally use Databricks uh, because we can just create different clusters. And in this case, I created a cluster with GPUs, uh, but I have so many problems uh, with it uh, because, um, <laughs> you know, uh, the documentation same one thing, and in the end, they have some, different, some differences in what you have in life. And if you need any more information to how to configure this Databricks cluster, just reach me after the talk, and I'm gladly explain to you how to do it. So I don't going to run it. I just run everything, so everything is. Uh, you are going to believe me. I mean, if you wanted to just execute one cell, I can do it, but I prefer not to do it because uh, we have experimented some connection issues today. So uh, in here uh, we have this notebook. The first thing that we normally do in Python is. Uh, to load all these uh, libraries in here. Also, we have here TensorFlow, right? And we can see that is, uh, you're going to see that it's going to be the new version and it's going to be awesome. How ca what can we do with this? So first of all, uh, we need to just take uh, something at that set. So we are using our target um, Spanish English data set. So we are going to translate from Spanish to English. And normally, uh, we need a couple of functions to put all our data in uh, form. In this case, we 
did some kind of function in here to just clean uh, some of the data and put uh, in a way that we can understand, or maybe it's best to say that the artificial intelligence model is going to understand. So what is this about? Uh, you have here some uh, different phrases in which we put to just use uh, in, the, in the training. We have here uh, what these phrases uh, are seem to be trained. And then uh, we create this data set only for uh, 30,000. It's a uh, data set, almost 100,000 examples in there. But only for demo purposes, we take a bit of it and to see what is going to be this, this translation. We then create some tensors of training. And what we are going to do is just uh, adjust the output of, the, of our network. As we said in the beginning, uh, these recurrent neural networks, uh, they give us some kind of numbers at the end, right? So what we did was code and tag all that information uh, with assigning numbers to all of the different words in our corpus. And uh, in this way, what we are obtaining at the end is the translation that we wanted, right? So after we created the entire data set and we have the data set in a form that our network can just uh, understand, we are going to build it. So did you see, did you see what Pablo saw us a moment ago and how difficult it was to just only uh, represent a function in TensorFlow uh, 1.0? Uh, all of you know Keras. Uh, this is how this TensorFlow 2 creates models. It's so simple. Right now, it's just only uh, six lines of code. Uh, see, uh, there are five layers there. Um, what with this, uh, we can just create something so powerful with so less code that is so wonderful that you wanted to do it uh, by yourselves, right? Only with these six lines, we are going to make this translator. We are going to make magic, okay? So, okay, we configure this model. And after having some uh, configuration also for the how to compile this model and train it for later, we just obtain this is our the summary of our model right here, okay? If we see the number of parameters that are going to be trained, are those in here like 31 millions? I don't know, but this blows my mind every time that I saw because I was unable to just train a simple neural networks in 2010 with only 200 parameters. And right now I have 31 million parameters there. So it is amazing what we can do right now. Okay, so well, after just saying this, uh, we are going to save this model. And finally, we are going to train. We only need one default mm, call there. This feed is going to train the model. It's not that bad, right? I don't know how, as we said before, some of us uh, work with TensorFlow, but imagine when we have to define all the loss functions, all those uh, error, all those batches, all those training steps. It's amazing. How can we just create all of this with only one sentence in there? Okay, so after we run this, we just train everything and obtain kind of a figure of merit in here. But I don't know you, but mm, I'm so bad with this. Uh, I prefer some examples to, to see it. So how about, uh, as this data set don't, didn't have the hasta que se seque el malecón, we are going to just use another thing. We are going to just pass a phrase, a normal phrase there and see what is uh, this translation. In there we can see that uh, this model is perfectly extracting the, um, the, the structure of the phrase, and it is able to identify all the, the sequence that we are passing through it and uh, translate perfectly in a new one in here, okay? But in addition, uh, it is not only for, these are simple uh, phrases, right? And maybe it is very simple, our model, didn't reach uh, a stage of uh, we are successful to say that we can put this in production. So normally what we did is just to study a bit more and create more complex structures, right? And as we see these six lines um, model in there, 
I wanted to explain how it's inside that model also with the new um, model that we wanted to study is the model with attention, right? What is that? Um, in here, we can see that we have like different units, right? The blue ones, red ones, and another that are like in gold. Uh, the blue ones are the ones extracting all the information from the input text, in this case is uh, English, and is extracting that information. And so in some part of, the, of that diagram, we are processing it in a context vector, okay? What is that? Uh, this context vector is what is going to do is just select from the vectors that is coming from the from this model the ones that has more um, importance uh, in the output. So it can translate uh, quicker and um, train quicker our network. Um, in this case, we are translating from English to French, but I wanted to continue with our Spanish to English uh, example. Uh, so we are storing in, in this context vector uh, as in the recurrent neural network that uh, kind of a store inside the, the feedback. We are doing the same thing with this context vector, but also is extracting the more important um, words inside it. Okay, so this is uh, what is uh, the blue ones are called encoders. Um, the red ones are called decoders. And that was the previous LSTMs uh, layers that we put previously. And uh, then uh, we have an attention layer in which we are extracting that information and it is defined. Uh, here I have the code also, but I wanted to just show lines and everything. So I wanted to show you how after this uh, model is trained, uh, a better representation of what is doing inside the network. So imagine that we have this, again, our phrase here, hace uh, mucho frío, aquí. So how is the network extracting all this information? So in here, we have a matrix in there in which we can see the correspondence, uh, the correspondence between different um, vocabulary words of both uh, languages. Uh, English in one side, Spanish in the other one. So from here, uh, the ones that are brighter are the ones that are more focused on the attention layer and are the ones that are have been extracted there to just translate the ones from English to Spanish, okay? But uh, in this case, uh, this uh, phrasing here is really common, maybe it has a very common structure. Also, normally we put something like uh, an intensifier and an adjective there. So what happens if we just alter uh, this uh, structure or we use other uh, vocabulary that we didn't train or maybe it's not even tested because uh, what we are going to test or this data set was test for uh, subject, um, verb and the rest of complements, but in here we are only putting some kind of subject in there. So the problem is that, okay, it recognized something in here, but it's not able to create that correlationship and have mm, an orthogonal, orthogonal matrix in there to just decode perfectly into the translation. So how can we uh, fix it? Maybe train with other structure, enrich our data sets, or maybe uh, could be another thing, I don't know. Uh, we will have to study this more in detail. So that was the part of the code that I wanted to show. Good, that's not bad at all. So just as a little bit of a summary there, uh, three things I think that are really important. First of all, uh, TensorFlow 2.0. You can see that it really simplifies our lives. Second, the fact that even a very simple model uh, without attention, is able to capture the semantic of the language, the grammatic of the language. We have not taught anything about verbs, subjects, or grammatics. Just learn how it works. I think it's quite amazing. And um, for the addition of uh, attention, which is going to uh, put the focus in the correct parts of the sentences that need to be analyzed, I think it's all quite interesting. But, it is, but I'm not really that impressed. <laughs> I'm not really that impressed because we I can improve that. LSTMs have a couple of drawbacks. First of all, the fact that they are sequential by nature, being sequential means that you cannot parallelize inside a given sample. And actually, this is going to impact as well in the inference phase. And secondly, 
we are working with a very large memory foot footprint. So this creates a lot of issues in parallelizing uh, uh, across the data sets. So, well, they are great, and they definitely were a great improvement. The behavior of the forget gate, things like that that we have spoken, they are amazing. But we have new things that I think you, <laughs> you will enjoy. <laughs> Transformers, obviously. Optimus Prime. <laughs> Um, Transformers are something really new. We're talking about June uh, 2017, so it's two years old. And actually, there have been a couple of implementations in addition to this, BERT, and so on. But this is really amazing. So um, <coughs> a white paper was published in, again, June 2017 by uh, Google. Uh, it's uh, attention is all you need. It's a pivotal paper. It's something you really, if you are interested in NLP, you really want to read that paper. And if you don't want to read that paper because it's far from your grasp for whatever reason, uh, just go to the internet. There's a lot of dissections of the paper that explains it little by little. And it, it's quite amazing. That was the idea for the talk today, by the way. I was convinced <laughs> that it was not a good idea. So we trimmed down the session a little bit. Uh, <coughs> so I'm going to just focus on the, on the basics. And the basics is, first of all, this is not a recurrent neural network. That's the surprise we were talking in the beginning. We are not going to work with sequences. Uh, we are going to work with one very special encoder, one very special decoder, and this is going to do the work for us. Uh, so how this is going to be working? Well, first of all, it's going to work very well. Uh, so in terms of performance, and I'm not talking about the speed of training or the speed of inference, I'm talking about the performance against some baseline analytics, some baseline metrics that we are using for uh, challenges of machine translation kind. Uh, when it was published, it was the best by very far margin. Uh, so we were talking about RNNs, there were other approaches, is, and actually some of the best approaches, is, you can see here, were convolutional neural network approaches, is, but this <coughs> improves the performance of any convolutional neural network approach or any RNN-based approach. Uh, and how does it work? Again, very simplified version. We are going to have the original, uh, the original sentence coming into our encoder. We are going to have the part of the sentence we have already translated going into the uh, decoder, the input decoder. And this is going to basically use some self-attention layers this is going to feed this in another self-attention layer in the decoder, which is going to uh, select the right combination of encoders and decoders, because we will have several encoders and decoders working in parallel, which is, by the way, one of the great uh, things that the model uh, throw into the, into, the, into the wild. And then we will just have a soft softmax, which is going to classify the more likely word in our entire 50K number of, of, uh, of words in our, in our dic dictionary, in our corpus. So this is basically how it's going to work. So uh, if you think this is complex, please thank Sedu, who convinced me not to go into the details, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> according to some of the faces I'm seeing here, I think they are deeply thankful. Um, so the point here is transformers are amazing. Uh, transformers are really a change in the state of the art. And right now, they are being used not only for, for machine learning translation or for automated translation, but for other scenarios, including uh, um, video and audio processing in real time, which are quite amazing. You can actually take a look into them, into the library Tensor to Tensor by Google. Uh, there's a lot of pretty good materials there. Uh, there's one piece I want to put a little bit of a focus. It's just 10 seconds, but the self-attention. It's something that you really want to take a look into. It's going to basically select what's going to be the most relevant part. It's actually the, the goal of it is going to be very similar to the forget gate into to the LSTMs. It's going to select what's really important and what's really going to be contributing. Um, but it's well a different technique, really interesting. So I think you wanted to tell us a couple of things. Yeah, so um, till now. We were training something to always related with text, okay? We have labeled data set. We have uh, different things that we saw also in the demo that we know the relationships between all that we have in the input and also the things that we wanted in the output. But how about if we have something that we don't know, okay? 
Imagine that a Klingon wanted to talk to a Vulcan. We really don't know about how we're going to communicate, right? Uh, so if we don't have the faintest idea of how to translate this, how can we do it? Okay, one approach. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, but you know, Star Trek is kind of fiction. What? I don't what? want it to just crush your dreams. What are you saying? But I, I, did, I didn't understand that. I presume that. Yeah, I know, English. I know. I'm going to respect you. You need to work on your English. I, you know I know, I, I know, I know. I respect <laughs> you, but they are not there. So how can we build this with our own things right now? So we weren't thinking these right and common things and. Uh, what Paolo said about word embeddings, that it has all these representations inside of a corpus, not only one word, also the representation from different words, right? And the relationship between them. Between them. Um, imagine that um, you have two uh, similar languages, not in words, but more in culture things, right? Imagine French and English, or maybe German and French, or us Spaniards with, with English. Uh, and we wanted to, and we don't know the relationship between the different uh, languages, right? We can create a model, okay, that can infer that relationship from there. We can just encode that relationship about the differences and also the relationship between the different things and create an agnostic uh, language model that can uh, be like just make a transformation in the matrix space, okay? It's like you have a huge matrix and a place or um, do some kind of rotation or maybe uh, apply that mathematical uh, operation. I don't know if you like it. Well, I might like it. I don't understand it. <laughs> but the thing is, let me put it on my context here, okay? So I am on the Voyager, okay. on the Delta Quadrant, looking at the yeah. stars. So I take a snapshot of that stars. Mm -hmm. And I'm on the Enterprise, on the Alpha Quadrant. And I'm looking at the stars, different perspective. So what you're implying is that we can shape the cloud of stars, find the correct rotation, point, uh, make them one on top of the another, and that's going to allow us to use the same embeddings and then use the words from one of the embeddings, the words, the words from the other. For right? sure. And you tell that's me that Star Wars doesn't help. Yeah, that's it. You can just that's navigate right now as you navigate through space, you can do it through words. Okay, <laughs> now this is really interesting. What we are implying here is that if I understand one language and I have the embeddings of one language, and there's another language I don't have any idea at all, I've never heard, I might have the same embeddings applied to this other one. And if I know one word and I know this is in proximity to other ones, I can infer the other ones quite easily. So I can learn with no tags with no annotations, a new language. But obviously that will be massively dependent on the culture because I expect in the Amazons this is not going to work yeah. correctly, right? Yeah, because maybe they didn't know the work mobile phone or they didn't know that or even they can create new colors because in the jungle they need it for communication with uh, the other persons inside the tribe. So yeah, it's kind of dependent, but Okay, you said that, but I wanted to go beyond that word. Wow. Okay? <laughs> so <laughs> imagine this, right? Imagine that we have a language and another language. We can create something that can extract that information, okay? We can create something that can extract something from English to English, something from Spanish to Spanish. And how about if we just swap those last parts? Right? We can just create something like this. So what we are doing is just, as Mariano Rajoy suggested a couple of years ago, machines that are building machines, right? We just make the uh, machine to infer the relationship of the different languages and then swap them. So you can go inside and just create your own translation from the different languages there. So it's amazing. And thanks all to Mariano Rajoy to inspire <laughs> us to do this and make put us the challenge to do it. Again, just to translate, talking about translation into English, actually. Basically, what we are implying is if we learn how to translate from English to Spanish, 
then we can do the reverse path automatically, and this yeah. is amazing. Okay, and this is being done. And I don't know if you can say yeah. something about this. Because yeah, I really like this one. This is uh, machine reading comprehension is in nature a kind of problems which try to extract actual knowledge out from the from the texts. So this is a project that well. Um, in our company, Plain Concepts, we helped Microsoft build for, uh, for the AI labs. And this was at the beginning of last year, using the latest state of the art, the, the latest technologies. Well, it was the ResNet models. Uh, and it was implemented so you will add some arbitrary test, ask some arbitrary question, and then you will have sometimes a good answer. <laughs> sometimes. But that's normal because even the state of the art will throw an F1 score of 40 something, 50, 50 lows. So it's, that's where we are, or where we were a year ago. We have improved the situation, not massively. This is going to be one of the <laughs> biggest, biggest challenges we have in NLP. But I, this is something very dear to me, and I think this is, this is amazing. And uh, this is a very interesting line, because again, to put this in context of business, this is going to be tooling that allows for companies is this is something that we are seeing in the day to day uh, companies that have a lot of contracts with a lot of companies and well do you know what I live in the UK <laughs> so I'm affected by Brexit so I know what that is and a lot of companies they know what that is and that means that they have to go through all the contracts all their legal binding documents to see if there are some clauses that are impacted by by Brexit and so on so this allows to do some quick search or well not quick some freestyle uh, search on, on the text corpus of the contract. So a lot of very interesting scenarios. Back to you. I have something for you. Oh, really? Uh, yep. <laughs> we have also some kind of things uh, that happened this, uh, this year, at the beginning of the year. You know that we are in a data era, right? We are surrounded by uh, this <coughs> any kind of um, IoT, uh, mobile phones, all of them are generating data that we can use for creating huge models. Um, because of that, at the beginning of the year, the OpenAI uh, created this GPT-2. It's a huge model uh, that increases the, th the different tasks, uh, uh, percentage in the different tasks in there for natural language processing. But the idea that they had was, how about if we just can train something from all the massive data that we have right now, and what can we do with that? Because the idea is, as that graph uh, is in there, is if we put more data inside those models, it can be maybe surpass a human. I'm not so optimistic, and um, maybe Pablo really like it, because we are uh, approaching a Star Trek uh, scenario, but I don't, I don't think that only data is going to give us that key. Um, so this was very controversial. We have kind of uh, different things. Um, yeah, the headlines it, were yeah. a little bit. <laughs> also, it worried a lot of people, but my favorite is this one. <laughs> it's going to break internet. Yeah, but what do, what do we say about that? Not today, Not today. Pablo. Not, Not today. today. <laughs> so remember, we just talk about natural language processing, but we are in there. But there's a lot of things uh, that it can be done for supporting not only uh, our uh, curiosity, also a lot of tasks in there that can be used to increase um, the different parts of uh, our different businesses. And uh, also it can be uh, used, and but it presents some tasks that are not yet uh, solved. Those are the challenges that also we are focusing in there. For me, uh, one special one is the context when we talk, because maybe don't you know, but bots and also the half duplex thing that have Google in there, it's um, something amazing. It can deceive us that is understanding us, but something happening there that is not uh, creating those interactions that we said from the beginning in the hair movie. So. The end game in here is that we need some kind of AI that can be generalized. It can not only uh, apply for one uh, scenario, it can apply for many different problems, and it can solve 
not only just the translation, maybe the translation, and comprehend that someone is asking the model to translate something to any of the languages that are available. So that is the next step that is going to face this artificial intelligence. And I'm really optimistic. Uh, maybe in, I don't know, in a couple of years now, but in a couple of decades, we are in that uh, scenario there, and we reach the end game. Well, I'm not so optimistic as you are, uh, but seriously, do you think the singularity is going to come soon? Yeah, you know, it was announced today. It was in November. In November. So we right. will be there, right? Yeah, actually. So if you're not interested in this kind of stuff, I don't know if you've been to the keynote, in to Pablo's keynote, but we are going to start holding a very large event, yep. only pure data and AI and ML. It was announced today. It's going to be the sing singularity tech journey. Uh, so if you're interested in the actual uh, nuts and bolts of these very highly technical workshops, talks, and business sessions as well. Uh, that's going to be happening in November, and we are going to be there, so yep. it will be great to meet you there. So I think that's it. Do you have questions about the session? Any comments, your opinions? Nothing, really? Well, I have to tell you something. <laughs> I don't really mind if you don't have any question because just being here for the whole hour, last session of the day, again, kudos to you. That's awesome. So good. So last round of thanks for the organizers and a very, very special dear friend, you uh, <laughs> know, hasta que se seque el malecón. We have here Jacob. Okay, thank you. I do.